All right, so thank you all for coming. I know everybody's really busy getting ready for surf, so I'm glad you all could take the time to come and hear this talk. It's going to be super cool, so you will all be glad that you came. Um, no pressure, Niels. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce Niels Volkenborn. Um, Niels is from Germany and did his PhD at the University of Bremen um, and the Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology. He then did a postdoc at the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany, and then he was lured to the U.S. to work with Sally Wooden and David Wethy at the University of South Carolina, where he did some really cool stuff with um, uh, recording pressure waves in critters that I think he's going to show today. Um, he is now an assistant professor at the School of Marine, Sci Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook University, um, and he's been doing some really interesting stuff for a long time, so I'm really excited that you guys get to hear about his work. And he'll also be at SURF next week, so um, if you don't catch him here, you can um, grab him at SURF and chat. Um, we're also going to be, he's, he's down here in part to give Sai his oral exam, he's on Sai's committee, so um, this afternoon, assuming all goes well, um, we'll be uh, celebrating probably 4.30 or 5. The plan was on the heck deck, but it may get moved inside to probably the conference room or something. But um, look, from, look around my office and find us if you want to chat with him um, afterwards or congratulate Sai, either one. So. <laughs> um, all right, Niels. All right, uh, can you all hear me? Well, so many good reasons to be here. Thank you very much for introducing me and for inviting me. And I'm looking forward for, to today, to the next week, to be staying a little longer on Dolphin Island, great place. And today I want to talk, yes, a little bit about the various work I have been doing over past years. And I really want to talk about one specific aspect of bioturbation that many of you may be not totally familiar with which is bioadvection, which I think is one critically important aspect of bioturbation in kind of sandy, permeable sediments. And um, I want to start talking about why sediments, and many of you hopefully agree with me. And by the way, that brings me also to one thing. When I started to be at SOMAS, I looked at this logo, I like it, but I, since I'm there, I'm working on changing it <laughs> Because I feel it's stupid that our school does not include the seafloor in its... Uh, but, well, so far I didn't succeed. So, why studying the seafloor? Uh, just some facts that you probably are familiar with. Marine sediments are simply uh, a large part of the superficial earth and thus deserve some attention because processes that happen there will eventually have important implications for atmospheric oxygen concentrations, for example, or CO2 concentrations. Coastal sediments and specific, specifically are very important when we think about global carbon cycling um, because it's so close to the overlying water, because it's so close to riverine input. A huge, uh, the largest part of organic carbon burial as well as mineralization occurs in co coastal sediments. Therefore, there are lots of organisms in these sediments that play, uh, well, they, that use these resources, but at the same time, it's also important if we just think about global carbon cycling. And globally, we know that about 10 centimeters or one Bernie of sediment depth is constantly bioturbated. That is a global average. Obviously, in some of these coastal environments, it can be much, much deeper, the bioturbated horizon, as you will see today. So here you see one of uh, the seascapes that is bioturbated. And in the beginning of this little seminar, I want to introduce you to some of my favorite organisms and how they um, um, uh, create the seascape in different parts of, our, of, of the world. So this year is a picture taken in the German Wadensee, and I will return to this location today several times. Because this is one of my heroes, is the lugworm Arenicola marina, one of the, well, in this case, very abundant organisms over tens and hundreds of kilometers of coastline. But they can also be abundant on the east coast, further north on the east coast of the U.S., on the west coast of the U.S., mostly a cold water species, even though they are warm water species as well. So these worms, they live in J-shaped burrows, and um, uh, I will show you what they do later on. Um, this is a seascape, well, this is actually also lugworms in France, so just another example of where they occur. Um, they lived in this J-shaped burrows, 
They um, poop sediments that say they subduct from the surface down here. They poop it out here. Um, um, uh, as you see, the, the sediment is subducted quite efficiently. Eventually, these guys will make your experiments very messy. You also have to feed them, unlike many other deposit feeders, which you can happily keep in an aquaria for a long time. These you really have to feed, because otherwise, these narrow aquaria will empty. Half, uh, half of it will be empty quite quickly. At the same time, they use these peristaltic body movements to pump water into the sediment because as all of these animals, they need oxygen and these sediments are typically anoxic, so they need somehow to have a connection to the overlying water and pump water into their burrows. <clears throat> this is a picture taken in Langeban in South Africa, another very nice intertidal embayment. Um, picture here from Alcia Bay in the uh, northwest of the United States. In both cases, thalassinid thalass shrimp are the creator of these seascapes. These burrowing shrimp, they build quite extensive burrows, specifically those species that deposit feed, like this year's Neotropia californiensis. So over time, they build these extensive burrows, but they are constantly extending those at, in search of, of food. They uh, build these larger areas in which they can turn around. They can have multiple burrow openings, in this case, um, this animal started to establish a burrow opening here in the center, later on here. They move, they are busy all the time, and you will see this in their biogeo biogeochemical signature in a moment. So they move around, they use their pleopods here to move water, they stick their tails into these narrow parts of the burrow, and by these pleopod paddling, they basically pump water through their burrows. And you, are, you see that the sediments surrounding the burrows are also quite efficiently oxygenated by these by this irrigation activity. Sometimes you only see not such impressive surface topography changes, but clearly feeding um, um, uh, traces of animals. In this case here, this is a picture from Falls Bay in Washington. These are the traces of a burrowing clamp, a telinic clamp that have large excurrent siphons. If this animal goes down, you will see what I mean. This is the incurrent siphon moving around on the in the search of microphytobenthos at the surface. You see here an area where the sediment is always, well, moving uh, tremendously. This is the excurrent siphon, which remains below the surface because they want to avoid sticking something out to be eaten. So they keep these below the sediment surface. Now I think it's somewhere here. Actually, now later on you see that the, the color change here in the sediment where the animal previously was injecting water. Uh, I will talk more about why that may happen in a, in a short moment. So, if we think about bioturbation as a whole, we can think about particle reworking. And in bioturbated sediments, we oftentimes see this, these um, graded bedding. So, oftentimes we have a surface sediment that is kind of oxic, maybe some black sediment. This here is a shell layer. Shell layer, shell particles often accumulate below the feeding depth of organisms if, if they are abundant because these are particles that simply sink through the sediment and are not ingested. Um, the time scales of on which this particle reworking occurs, I would say is maybe on, 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 on the scale of months or years, maybe decades. At this, uh, so these are just like different layers and partially they are bioturbated. Partially, they are produced by bioturbation. Below, obviously, you find layers which are not bioturbated at all. At the same time, these animals bioirrigate, meaning they somehow pump water into the burrow or in, through their bodies and inject it into the sediment. They, by doing so, they inject a lot of relevant electron acceptors, obviously oxygen, but also nitrate. With it, maybe some particulate organic matter is transferred into the sediment matrix. They pump relatively high pH water, typically, like overlying water pH conditions, into the sediment. And what we often measure is th are the things that are the products of organic mineralization, dissolved inorganic carbon, depending on the nitrogen pathways that are happening at a specific site, different forms of nitrogen, maybe reduced iron that is mobilized within the sediment and then can flux out of the sediment. And typically within these sediments, we have relatively low pH conditions, so uh, potentially also lower pH water exits the sediment. Um, 
Man much of this irrigation, as you will see, happens on much shorter time scales. While sediment, for example, in an area like this may be eaten once every year, the pore water in this region may be replaced every few days. And you will see how we came up with these, or how we can estimate these numbers in a moment. In shallow sediments, well, all this is obviously dependent on the organic matter flux. Uh, in shallow systems, it's not only the uh, organic matter flux that comes from the overlying water, it's also the microphytobenthos, so the microalgae that live at the sediment surface. And these will also play some role in my seminar today. If we now think about just bioirrigation and how this can impact sediments, there are different situations how irrigation uh, may happen in, these, uh, in sediments. So you can think of a burrow that is very well lined, it's like a pipe, and there's really not much exchange with the surrounding water. This is rare. Oftentimes there is some exchange of water within the burrow and the surrounding sediment, but specifically in muddy sediment, this is pretty much uh, uh, limited to diffusion. In more sandy sediments, many animals, or some animals, like the lugworms, they actually have blind ending burrows. And part of their way to live is actually injecting water through the sediment. So they only have one opening through which they pump water and they inject it into the sediment to replenish it with oxygenated water from above. <clears throat> so we have models to describe these different situations. Bob Allers' classical cylindrical model relates uh, burrow distance and burrow, burrow diameter to worm size and distance between worms and so on. The main point here is the fluxes are governed by diffusion, which relates somehow to diffu diffusion coefficient but really relates to concentration gradient over a specific distance. It's different in this advective, advective system where Philip Meismann did some really cool work back in the uh, uh, two th early th 2000s, this pocket injection model, where we really need to think about the streamlines of water flow through these systems. And the governing parameters here, rather than the diffusion coefficient, is, uh, is the sediment permeability that we can measure um, and then flow occurs along pressure gradients through the sediment. Now this was assumed in this model, um, and I should mention that the velocities, how fast, for example, uh, example, an oxygen molecule will move through the sediment, is very different under these diffusive conditions, maybe on the scale of a millimeter per hour. With advection, oxy water and the the oxygen within the water can move very rapidly, tens of centimeters per hour. So when I came to South Carolina, Sally, De uh, Sally Wooden and David Weather, they just started to work with pore water pressure sensors because they thought, okay, if we predict that pressure gradients are the underlying force of pore water advection, we should be able to measure it. So they, at that time point, developed pressure, pore water pressure sensors that I have used since then quite a lot because they are really cool. You can stick them into the sediment, and this is David and Sally. Unfortunately, both are retired. I don't know why the good people all oh, stop working. But So we have st uh, put these sensors, and I'm still using well, different kinds of sensors, but in principle, pore water pressure sensors, you just simply stick them in the sediment, and even if you are 10 or 5 centimeters away from an organism, you can measure its activity, as it's pumping water, there will be fluctuations in pore water pressure that we can measure. A pressure record of a lugworm, for example, can look like this, where for some period of time the animal is doing this peristaltic movements, and you can see these little oscillations. Each of those is one of these peristaltic movements along the body. The worms are pooping every now and then, shooting out two milliliter of sediment or so. That creates a large negative pressure signal in the sediment. When a worm is burrowing through the sediment, typically we see these large oscillations between positive and ne negative pressure, um, uh, 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 pore water pressures. So just like now knowing that these animals pressurize the sediment, most of the time we can infer that most of the time sediments that, that are inhabited by worms are pressurized. At the same time, we see every now and then 
there are behaviors that are associated with a negative pore water pressure. In these situations, the pore water flow actually reverses. So water is flowing towards the burrow, for example, as the animal expels or poops out to a milliliter of sediment that basically moves out some volume that will create a negative pressure. So in that moment, water will be forced towards the burrow, not bringing oxygen to the animal, but that's just like the result of, of what they do. So we have done these poor water pressure records or recordings for quite, well, for different types of key species. Um, so here the Aranicolate polychaete, just like here showing you three species, I already introduced you two. So the phallocinid shrimp, as they move through the sediment and irrigate at different uh, sections of the burrow, you may have higher or smaller plateaus. There are uh, large burrowing signals associated when this animal is burrowing into the sediment. But as they ex well, um, in inject water through the excurrent siphon, you see these plateaus. You even see, ca you can see single, well, uh, siphon movements by these animals and single valve collapse that you can get from these records. So at some point I thought, okay, well, so we get all kinds of information about their behavior, what they are doing, so that's a nice tool of studying their response to environmental changes. The more important thing for this seminar, however, is that they all induce poor water pressure dynamics. And poor water pressure dynamics means poor water is moving because there will be gradients in the sediment. So at some point when I, I thought it would be cool if we can use this to produce some sound and think about this, obviously it's speeded up, it's not true sound, but if you listen to it, it's not very loud, well you will hear the burring. So in that sense, these sediments are pretty noisy, and the noisiness here just means the pore water is moving all the time. You can visualize how efficiently pore water is moving by injecting traces into the sediment. So this is an aquarium that some of my students set up in a class I gave. Uh, in these end farm aquaria, we try to do something here with, uh, with, with, with dyes to look at particle reworking. The particle reworking portion was really boring. Uh, oops, sir. But the injection of fluorescein was actually kind of cool. So at the same time, we also measured pressure. And I know it's hard to look at two things twice, but if you look at the red line and see whenever there is a positive pressure, you see that the, dyes, that the dye is moving upwards. So there is this general trend, just like over these few hours here, what is it, like six hours, that all this dye was moved out by a random combination of animals. I don't know exactly which animal was responsible here for what. But the combined effect, effect of this community here, razor clam and nereid, two maldanid polychaetes, they induced this poor water or these traces to move out. So one maybe interesting aspect of this is how far does an animal affect this poor water flow through the sediment? And so this is actually how I learned to know Sally and David, because at that time point I was working in Germany with lugworms, and we were, they were coming and we were looking at the pressure gradients, so in principle if we are, have pressure, um, uh, pressure sensors close to an animal and away from an animal, so with some distance, how far can we trace the signal? And to me it was actually very surprising that on all these pressure sensors, even the ones that were like 60, 70 centimeters away, we could still could trace the pooping of a worm. So this gives you an idea about this. The signal obviously decays exponentially from at, at distance. The signals are high when you are close to the animal, small when you are further away. Still, it means that if you can measure half a meter away some signal, that means half a meter away, the pore water is moved by this individual a little bit. So based on these pressure records, we estimated that a lugworm that pumps maybe 1.5 milliliter per minute replaces about 10% of the pore water within a radius of uh, 12 centimeters. A radius of 12 centimeters looks like this. And on a lugworm tidal flat where you may have 50 per square meter, it looks like this. So all these spheres of influence, they overlap, 
And just like, well, very basic modeling, <laughs> you can figure out that there are regions within the sediment where the pore water is entirely replaced on the scale of one or two days. Because as the seas overlap, there will be areas where more water is forced or replaced per time. So by now, I hopefully I could convince you that pore water pressure and bioadvection may be more relevant than we typically think. There are species and behavior-specific pressure waveforms. This advection is intermittent because the animals are not perfect pumps that do all the same all the time. Uh, it's bidirectional because they are, in all these animals, you have behaviors that are associated with flow reversal, typically shorter and more in bursts, but definitely it's happening. <clears throat> we can measure those pressure gradients or pressure signals more than 10 centimeters away from the source. They occur at permeabilities of, let's say, higher than 10 to the power of minus 13, so m very muddy sands. So sediments that we typically don't recognize as being permeable, but they have obviously to have some permeability, and I think this value makes sense. Another thing I want to mention here, I showed you this thalithinid shrimp before. Um, as these animals establish multiple openings, we still can record these pressure dynamics, meaning it's not this advection of these pressure dynamics and advection is not limited to animals that build these blind ending burrows. It's also true if you have an animal that has multiple openings because the burrow has some strange shapes. So even if the animal is pumping water through this kind of burrow with multiple openings, it will still induce pore water pressure that will result in advection. So for the remainder of the seminar, I want to give you some examples of why I think it's important to think about bioadvection and how um, bioadvection is critical for the function of sediments. I will talk a little bit about sediment biogeochemistry, about benthic ecology and microphytobenthos, and a little bit about uh, some more recent results on calcium carbonate and iron sulfides. So our past view on sediments, for example, based on um, Microsensor, set, uh, microsensor measurements looks like this. If we measure an oxygen profile and we measure another one and we measure enough, we can get a two-dimensional map and we clearly see that there are some structures in the sediment, like a burrow of an animal, where oxygen penetrates much deeper into, into the sediment. Now, there are really cool new technologies, and this is one that I have been working now over the last 10 years or so, um, which are oxygen planar optodes. So these are films that are sensitive to oxygen and with a fancy camera you can take images of the fluorescence lifetime. That allows you to get an image of the oxygen distribution, which can look like this. So this is one of these end farms with a burrowing shrimp. You see some areas here are oxygenated. So one of these images basically give you more than 1,000 profiles with a single shot. And the cool thing is that you can take an image every 30 seconds or every 30, uh, 60 seconds. So we now can visualize, well, estimate, measure the oxygen dynamics within these sediments. And you see that as the animal is moving through the burrow, irrigating in different regions, you see oxygen, uh, uh, oxygen pockets evolving and then oxygen decaying. You see also here at the sides of this aquarium that there's water pushed out through the side. And sometimes when you have ne negative pressure in the sediment, water, uh, oxygenated water sucked in. This is part of well, this experimental setup that we had at the time. But you see, again, giving you an idea that this entire pore water here is pressurized or, well, positively or negatively while the animal is doing these kinds of things. Another example here are maldanid polychaetes that build these tubes, very abundant also along on Long Island, but I think also here. So these build, build these cavities. If you feed them with fresh organic metal, uh, matter, they tend to subduct the sediment down to depth because they are very well adapted to situations where food is not available all the time. And as they subduct this fresh organic matter, they also inject a lot of oxygenated water into these sediments. We can actually now measure also this excavation of these sediments. This is a sensor that Ian Weyer, a graduate student in my lab, has just built, finished to build, which is based on an Xbox Connect sensor, a 3D motion sensor. So with this now we can look down onto the sediment and see how over time 
the sediment topography changes. There were some issues with the black, uh, well, with the sulfitic dead zone here. But over time, you see here the absolute height of the sediment, and we can also look at the temporal changes in height or displacement of particles. So we can see regions where sediment is brought out to the surface and uh, areas where sediment is basically going down as a function of uh, reworking activities. But going back to oxygen dynamics, so this is just another example of a maldanite with a cube. Actually, this was a very cooperative an individual that builds its cube. So whenever anoxic water was leaving this tube, we could see this little anoxic spot here at the, um, above the sediment surface. And so if we now look in, at a profile over time, um, oxygen profile over time, at both at the surface and at depth, we see that they are clearly related with each other, which is not surprising because the driver is advection. At the same time, we can record the pressure. And if we move it a little closer, it's getting clear how well these two totally independent measurements match with each other because they are all part of the same story. Sediment pressurization, positive and negative pressure, the positives being associated with sediment subduction and irrigation of this cavity in the sediment. The negative pressure are related to burrow excavation, excavation so uh, increasing the volume of this void at depth. We can quantify those and partially because we want to know what these animals are doing, but partially because we can also use this kind of information for experiments in which we potentially want to simul stim simulate their ir irrigation activity. <clears throat> so oxygen dynamics, uh, oxygen is very dynamically distributed due to bioadvection around these different burrows. Um, obviously has an impact on the redox chemistry of these sediments. I think we still don't, don't understand how microbes deal with these rapid redox oscillations and what, is the, what are the some of the consequences on the biogeochemical processes that occur in these kinds of sediments. But we know that rather than thinking about, well, oxygen being present or not, we should maybe think more about the probability of oxygen being at a specific site, or even more so, how often a specific site around the burrow switches between oxic and anoxic con conditions, which we can do based on these op oxygen optode images. For now, however, I want to even focus more on the fact that all these activities in use are related to advection. So there are interesting regions around these burrows, directly around these burrows, but I hope I convinced you that there's also a lot of things happening in this bulk sediment that we, in oxygen images, typically don't see. But with these dyes, for example, we can see it. So one idea now would be, okay, there's lots of advection moving of pore water up potentially to the sediment surface. And since typically the pore water has much higher nutrient concentration, does this impact, for example, the microphytobenthos at the sediment surface? So this is some work we did a while ago, both in Germany and in, in, in the US, where we now didn't work with real worms, but instead we used these worms here, peristaltic pumps, which we could now program so that they would mimic what worms do. So we can program the intermittent irrigation of these buckets. Uh, we can pump with realistic volumes, but we can do this, uh, when doing this, we only mimic the irrigation. We get rid of all the particle reworking or so, so we can really focus on what bioadvection does. And in this experiment here, we use then a hyperspectral camera which with, which, with which we scanned the surface of these buckets in regular intervals. And from these hyperspectral images, we could infer um, chlorophyll A standing stock. This is how the images look like. And we can do this, obviously, then again and again. And the first cool thing that you see over the day, there's a lot of vertical migration of chlorophyll, well, of diatoms in these sediments. So during the middle of the day, they, well, they come out when it's sunny and during the night, night they go down. What, was, what, what is more important in the context of this um, seminar is that over time you see that the irrigated lacmur mimics, so the ones that received a little bit of irrigation at about uh, 15 centimeter depth, they started to uh, produce this much, much higher standing stock of microphytobenthos.
So after three days or so, it looked like this. The ones that received 1.5 milliliter per minute, so that's just a drop every few seconds, they showed this much higher um, chlorophyll concentration at the surface. So they were really active, producing pure oxygen here with these oxygen bubbles, the non-irrigated one, the, um, constant, uh, the chlorophyll concentration remained much lower. So these, in principle, bioadvection fertilizes microphytobenthic growth by pushing up this nutrient-rich water to the surface. Well, this is all in aquaria on small scale, and people would typically say, well, that's aquaria. So I want to go back a little bit and show you what I think is happening out there in the field, because I have the nice opportunity to show you some data from my PhD work, which was a large-scale lacworm exclusion experiment that I started 17 years ago, where I went out with a backhoe, we took away the upper 10 centimeters of the sediment, rolled out this mesh, and then put the sediment on top again. And so we ended up with these beautiful lugworm exclusion plots, and that's potentially one of the best way of figuring out what is the impact that these worms have on the systems. And I go a little, well, upside down now, because I've now showed you what I learned since then, um, but I thought it's interesting now to look back at those data that I got at the time. So one thing that I did 17 years ago or 15 years ago was looking at poor water concentrations of various species. So here I show you the poor water concentrations of ammonium and silicate. Um, and you see that in the exclusion sites, these concentrations increase with depth while on plots where lugworms were present, they really keep these, keep these concentrations low. It was even obvious when I did a transect from the lugworm side to the exclusion side that there was a relatively strict uh, uh, sharp boundary between the lugworm populated and the exclusion side in terms of, for example, here silicate concentrations. So these concentrations are very consistent with this very efficient flushing by these organisms. I also looked at chlorophyll. And what I found that on the exclusion side, chlorophyll is over the year always higher. So this is inconsistent of, with what I just talked about, that these animals fertilize microphytobenthos at the surface. But like so often, it's what we measure is the product of maybe various processes. So in this case, the high chlorophyll on the exclusion side does not necessarily mean that these systems are more productive. In fact, we also did this hyperspectral imaging of, well, in situ. And so this is here now a, a, a 30 centimeter wide strip and a, a one meter wide profile. This is a normal image, it's hard to see, but on this image you clearly see that the animals, which we know, feed on my, or digest microphytobanthos uh, that they subduct or di ingest with the sediment. When they poop it out, these fecal, fecal material is pretty much depleted of chlorophyll. So unlike the experiments where we just focus on bioadvection, here, or in reality, we always see the product of feeding by worms and potentially this fertilizing effect that they have. The flow of water can be very different in different sediment types. So this is a permeable sediment, this is a low permeable sediment, and you see as the animal is doing potentially pretty much the same thing, uh, only little of ox uh, oxygen supply you can see here at depth in this more muddy sediment because it's more reactive. Huge oxygen blooms here. Um, but even more obvious, or as obvious, are the differences that we see at the sediment surface. And specifically on, in these low permeable sediments, if you look at, let's say, a profile just above the sediment surface, above the sediment surface, and you look at this through time, you see that there are specific regions where suboxic and anoxic water leaves the sediment through potentially like little cracks in the sediment where bore water flow is so high and the pressures are so high that this low oxygen water is forced out through the sediment surface. So this is an interesting um, um, aspect of bioadvection because it could allow that reduced metabolites that are in the pore water that they are not trapped just below the sediment surface because um, they get in contact, contact with oxygen but um, 
they could be forced out across the sediment, across, uh, well, out of the sediment by um, this forcing of pore water out of the sediment. So we have now established these optocosms. We call them optocosms because they're kind of um, benthic chambers, mesocosms with optodes, and we now use different optodes. But for now, I just want to show you we irrigated these optocosms with 10 minutes per hour with about 0.4 milliliters per minute, really low. So this is four drops of water or something like this per minute, and just 10 minutes per hour. And we measured both iron in pore water and iron fluxing out. And it's so nice if you do geochemical work and you don't need to show numbers to convince you that there's a clear difference between what's going on. I show you the numbers anyway. So in these irrigated cores, there's hardly any iron in the, in the pore water. Lots of iron in the non-irrigated non optocosms. When you look at the flux, it's just the, uh, the other. Uh, well, it's just opposite. So despite the fact that pore water iron concentrations are really low, a lot of it is fluxing out. And that's basically the reason why there is so little. The opposite is true in the non-irrigated treatments. A lot of iron is present in the pore water, but it cannot leave the sediment because it's trapped within the sediment by this oxic lid. So in a broader context now, bioadvection can have huge impacts on biogeochemistry on very different levels. I don't see a clock here. I don't know where I am. All right. Yes. Um, so typically we think about sediments with this redox cascade. The people that work in sediments are familiar with this, I guess, that organic matter fuels this aerobic and anaerobic organic mineralization that is dominated by aerobic respiration in the surface sediment, ammonification taking place. Once this is depleted, nitrate, iron oxide, sulfate are other important electron acceptors um, that release, release these reduced dissolved constituents and, well, some bicarbonate and protons, so basically CO2 that reacts with water. So all these processes here are processes that produce alkalinity because even though they produce CO2, this does not have an impact on alkalinity. What is really happening is, for example, with sulfate reduction, just the sulfate reduction on its own consumes protons. <clears throat> These reduced metabolites may be then oxidized by other pathways. For example, nitrifiers, they use, if they have access to oxygen, they oxidize this ammonia to produce nitrite again, nitrate again. This nitrate itself can then be further used for denitrification. Um, so this is then coupled nitrification, denitrification. The iron can be oxidized in the presence of oxygen. The sulfide can be oxidized by the presence of oxygen. Now all these processes, they consume alkalinity because they produce protons. So the net of sulfate reduction and sulfate, sulfate oxidation is in, in the end aerobic organic matter mineralization with no impact on alkalinity. These reduced compounds, however, they can also react with each other. And one important pathway here is if you have abundant reduced iron and sulfide, this black iron sulfide precipitates, um, which can be oxidized as well. The iron monosulfides can further react to form UPSA, to form pyrite. And then all these protons consumed here, uh, produced here by CO2 released due to organic matter mineralization, they can, they can relate to calcium carbonate dissolution, just as we see throughout the water column, so this calcium carbonate dissolution. So this gives you, well, some of the biogeochemistry that I'm interested in in a nutshell, and I'm only showing you this because you will see that many of these dissolved constituents could now or will now be, as a function of bioadvection, will be leaving the sediment. So we totally change the biogeochemical ca character of the sediment. We change to what extent iron sulfide or pyrite can be formed, to what extent calcium carbonate may be dissolved due to acidic accumulation in the sediment. And I give you a few slides on what we most recently did is 
Since we now not only image oxygen, but, but also pH and CO2, we can get much more information about the biogeochemistry and the processes that occur. In this experiment here, we image pH and CO2 from this side of the aquaria and oxygen from the other side of the aquaria. We did this for one, two weeks. There were lugworms in some of them and not in others. Um, we also measured pore water pressure. So this is, I think, the first time in front of a large audience that I show these movies, so I'm excited, because this, for the first time, gives you basically co-registered, in this case here, oxygen and pH data. And just in this still, you already see that after a few days, this worm has really created a high pH environment in the region where it was irrigating. In these column, in these aquaria, we had included all these different sections of the sediment. So we started with a shell debris layer, then we added this iron monosulfide rich sediment and some sediment on top. And so as the animal is active, you see there are relations in the pH data and dynamics that we see. You see it here at the feeding funnel where sometimes high pH water is drawn down, but you also clearly see how this animal establishes this high pH environment um, where it's active. Very low pH here on the left side. So this here is what happens without lugworms on the same scale. So we really don't see where we are. If we change the scale, you see that without worms, the sediment gets much, much more acidic. We can look this on a longer time scale. On the left side here, you have the aquarium without, worm, without worms, here with a worm. And this is now a horizontally averaged profile across this entire aquarium. So after 50 days, you get a sense of the net impact of the worms. pH pretty much stays everywhere way above 7.5 7 with, the, with the worms. You even see here this little increased pH where the animal is injecting water. While without lugworms, the profile, pH profile is very different. This very low pH, almost 6.5, just below the oxic layer, indicating there's lot of, lots of reoxidation -oxida going on here, like iron sulfide diffusing up, it's reoxidized in this region, creating this very low pH conditions. So we can basically look at this kind of vertical profiles with and without lugworms, lugworms which I just showed you. Um, what we then did here is we injected, a, <coughs> sucked out pore water with rhizons, and from this we, as we measured alkalinity in these samples. Again, a huge difference between with lugworms and no irrigation. So without the lugworms, you see this massive accumulation of alkalinity, which is largely related to anaerobic metabolic activity or anaerobic mineralization without the reoxidation at depth. All the reoxidation re occurs up here, not at depth, because there's hardly any, well, oxygen, obviously, for example, penetrating that deep. Now, with uh, pH and alkalinity, we can estimate anything we want with, when it comes to the carbonate system. For example, we can calculate the aragonite saturation. And you see that the differences are not huge because this, these sediments are pretty well buffered due to this abundance of calcium carbonate shells. But what you, what you do see is that this uh, surface layer is strongly undersaturated without the worms, uh, while it remains close to one or even supersaturated with the worms. So one question now that we could ask ourselves is to what extent is such a shell layer, which is obviously produced by the particle reworking, is also maintained by the worms by creating conditions where calcium carbonate dissolution is less likely to occur. Now this is a close, uh, this is a potentially a slow process, so it's really hard to measure this. However, I was very excited when two years ago I saw a new Bing satellite image coming up and I could still see my lugworm exclusion plot. So I wrote a little grant, I got the money, so last summer we could go back. Um, there are the different plots here, 20 by 20 meter. Um, I still had the coordinates of the, of the control site, so we went out there. This is how they look today. So some of them don't look that beautiful and the lugworm population is not that dense anymore, but well, the mesh is still there, approximately at the same depth. There was actually a very nice area where 
A few years ago, uh, well, towards the end of my PhD thesis, I cut out a square meter of this mesh to actually transplant seagrass to see to what extent seagrass go grows better in a lugworm excluded area versus not. So I left these untouched and now this has become a little inclusion area because the worms really want to burrow deep. The juveniles settle on these plots, but they leave when they get large enough to burrow deeper. But here in this area, there is no mesh anymore, so perfectly inclusion area. <clears throat> so we went out, we took cores, uh, again like the shell layer. One of the questions that we try to answer now is, do we see a change in the amount of shell material that has been buried below the mesh for the last 17 years? And link this to the pore water, uh, to the pore water chemistry that we are in the process of measuring. So this is ongoing research. I don't have the data yet. One thing I can tell you that we saw minimal accumulation of material of shell above the mesh, suggesting potentially that these calcium carbonate shells that were formed in these upper layers were efficiently dissolved on the time scale of, this, uh, of, this, of these last 17 years. So there was no additional accumulation at the top. I also found, just like looking at the raw data of sieving out, um, a slight decline in the calcium carbonate content per, squ uh, per square meter on the exclusion side, suggesting, yes, that maybe without these worms, some of this calcium carbonate indeed got lost. So with the seminar, the summary or conclusion is really short. I really want you to believe me that Bioadvection is a very important process in some of these sedimentary systems. Uh, oftentimes we see a low standing stock, which does not mean not much is happening. It can actually mean that there's an extremely high turnover. Um, and in case of bioadvection, low standing stock of PUC, particulate organic carbon, pore water solutes, microphytobenthos, does not mean that these are deserts. It's just the opposite. And with calcium carbonate, it may actually be the opposite. So, but this is something we are working on right now. With this, I want to thank my collaborators, my funding agency, y'all, <laughs> for being here. And I look forward for an exciting afternoon and a few more days. And obviously, I'm happy to take questions.